and there we go hello good morning i guess for many of you out there first loves and turtle doves hope you're all doing well um it is sunday morning 101 a.m now in california i'm tad most of you i'm sure um, probably all of you have realized that um because i don't think otherwise you'd be like going gee i hope i could find a weird old bald guy to read to me tonight. Um, I mean, what, what are the odds, right? So, but here you are, and here I am, and here we go, and uh, that's basically what's going on. Um, before I do, anything that needs to be related? Yeah, just working. Just working. Um, I got my booster, so that's a good thing. We only have one unboosted family member left, and we will take care of that uh, probably next week. And other than that, uh, we're all still doing fine. We're hunkered. We hunker very well. We, uh, we hunker most hunkericiously. And we have uh, hunkered very, very solidly so far. Um, so all good on that front. I'm working, I'm working on Navigator's Children. Um, and as I think I've mentioned past things it's now I'm trying to integrate all the stuff that changed in what is now the third volume while I was working on it and integrating that into the what is now the fourth volume um, so into the narrow dark is largely out of my hands at this point although I'll get it back with copy editing and then um, when it goes to page proofs copy editing is when you get these days an electronic copy of the manuscript back with the copy editors suggestions queries um, outrage, <laughs> frustrations, all that stuff attached to it. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate in that my copy editor, Mary Lou, is very, very good. And um, not only that, she's a really good reader too. So every now and then she'll put something in the margin says, ooh, I really like this, or oh, that was a lovely scene, or something like that. And my, my shriveled old heart will, will warm briefly. Um, so, and, and that's because it, I know she's a smart person and a good reader. Um, so, you know, I'm not that nakedly hungry for praise that just any praise whatsoever, but from, you know, people that I trust, it's always a good feeling when they go, yeah, he did pretty well there. So that's what's going on with Into the Narrow Dark. And, um... Here, I'm trying to make my glasses sit properly so they don't confuse me. Um, what else? Uh, we're done with birthdays. We're done with Christmas. We're done with New Year's. We're done with all of that stuff now for several months. And then we have a raft of family birthdays in March. Um, so I'm, I don't have to do that. And fortunately, I've, the next birthday coming up, I've already bought a lot of the presents for during Christmas. So that's, that's one good thing because... It's too tempting, you know? I mean, my, my kids are like me um, in the sense that they like lots of things. They have lots of interests. So I'm always seeing things on, online and going like, oh, I could get that for so-and-so, or oh, I could get that. And, you know, if you're not careful before you, you're, you look up, you've, like, gotten way too many things, and then you have to pay for them, which, like, that seems totally unfair. But, hey, you know, who am I <laughs> to criticize capitalism? Um, but anyway, so in, in, a, in a larger sense, I am feeling a moment of great internal peace just to be past this time of the year, um, waiting for the dry weather so the dogs can go out without bringing back mud all the time, which is, of course, the current state of the house. There's mud all over the floor, little doggy footprints. You clean them up half an hour later, there's more muddy doggy footprints. Fortunately, as you can tell from my office, we do not live in a, some kind of clean freak uh, environment, not even close to it. But, you know, I mean, you know, you, you do when you see big blop, 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 muddy dog prints across the floor. There, you, you know, you're like, oh, God, I really should clean those up, even though you know that in another half an hour it's going to happen again. And there is no alternative because, you know, our dogs have not learned how to use the people bathroom. Although I've been told you can train them, but I mean, who has the time? Not me. So what else? Anything else? Um, yeah, not really. I mean, I've got lots of things, but they're not germane. One of these days, I'm going to give you guys a tour of the office. 
um, just because I've got lots of interesting little bits of art and stuff on the walls, much of which you can't see, which uh, I think is kind of fun um, and worth looking at. If you look over, whoop, wrong shoulder, <laughs> for instance, you can just barely see this guy here, but that is actually um, a cedar mask off an Egyptian coffin. Now this is very much late dynasty, um, you know, probably Ptolemaic, I would guess, or sometime around there, which is, you know, just at the very end of what we think of as, as, as Egypt, ancient Egypt per se. Um, you know, this is post Alexander the Great, the Ptolemaic dynasty, of course, was the di dynasty started by Ptolemy, who was one of Alexander, you guys know all this stuff, one of Alexander's generals, and along with Alexander's generals, when Alexander died in an untimely way, um, at the age of whatever it was, not very old, 32 something, um, they divided up his empire and Ptolemy got Egypt. And basically the Ptolemies hung on to it until Rome and the downfall of Julius Caesar and the revolution, civil war that followed that, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so this is not an ancient Egyptian artifact, but it is, in, well, it's a pretty ancient, I keep pointing the wrong way, it's a pretty ancient artifact and it's actually quite lovely. Um, I'm pretty sure it was a woman's, uh, from the, a woman's coffin uh, because of the hair, because um, of the, the ceremonial wig that is still partially visible on the wooden mask. Anyway, so there's like stuff like that that's actually worth looking at that one of these days I'll walk you around and show you. Um, but I'm going to clean it. <laughs> I'm going to clean the place up first because if you saw anything below where I am right now, it would be horrifying. I mean, as it is, you can see the jars and jars of cat litter. <laughs> so one of these days. I have lots of projects that I will get to one of these days. And now that I'm finally past the worst part of the year, things may calm down a little bit and I may get on with some of these projects, including some other video projects. Because I keep thinking about all the things somewhere. Here's a brief tad sideways. We will get to the reading, I promise, in just a moment. But here's a brief tad thing. I was trying to think earlier, like what, you know, what is the purpose of life. Not in a larger, you know, kind of religio philosophical point of view, but kind of what for me personally has been the point of my life. And besides trying to be a decent human being and to be good to the people around me, um, the people that I come into contact with, and besides liking to make things, creating things and sharing them with people, really the point of life as far as I have sort of subconsciously believed and only thought about more as I got older is, is learning things. But the thing about learning things is that, you know, I, I know me, I will be fascinated to learn new things right up until the day that I snuff it, which I hope is far in the future, needless to say. But, you know, th for what, for what, you know, that's the question that, that, comes to mind sometimes. It's like, what is all this knowledge going to do for me? Well, I mean, I think it makes me a better writer. I think it makes me a better human being in some ways. It's, it's also just purely my love of the world and the things in it that fascinate me. But the other reason to learn things is to be able to pass them on to others. And now I don't have the kind of learning, you know, in, in any one particular area that, you know, compels me to become a teacher. I don't have huge experience and knowledge of the, the Merovingian dynasties or the, the you know, the, the pompous, you know, the, the pompous lands of Argentina or anything like that. I don't know much about the life cycle of various spotted frogs. So I, I'm not like most writers, at least most fiction writers, I sh should say, I am a mile wide and an inch deep. I know a lot of little things about a lot of things. I know a lot of interesting things. I have some, what would we call it? Some synesthetic, no, nah, that's not quite what I want to say. Some, some, some knowledge about how things fit together, which I think is very important. And I think is one of the things that we should teach more of in school. 
you know, um, not just history, but teaching history and science and things like that, at, you know, so that we learn how things happen and what the connections are. Um, there used to be a wonderful English television program that we got here in the United States on PBS um, by a guy named James Burke, which was literally called Connections. And he would take one thing like, you know, the invention of the hammer. <laughs> no, no, that's too far back. You know, like the invention of the paper plate. And he would take you back through connections into all different kinds of things that, among other things, led to this particular moment when somebody went, hey, we could make plates out of paper and then people could just throw them away afterwards, you know, or whatever. And he would um, connect these all together in the most fascinating ways. So I've always thought that was really interesting, this kind of synthesis. That's the word I was looking for, not, not synesthetic, but s synthetic, putting things together and making things into other things. Um, so I would love to do that with some of the things that have been important to me in my life, not because I pretend to have great knowledge on any of them, but just because... I've been exposed to a lot of different kinds of things, a lot of music, a lot of books, a lot of stuff, movies, blah, you know, I mean, you name it, because in part of where I grew up and when I grew up and all these things that other people may not have run into. And so it wouldn't be a matter of wanting to teach people, but simply to say, hey, here's some really interesting things that I found out along the way and I would like to share. So that's kind of where I'm leaning toward in terms of doing a other types of projects besides just reading. Anyway, so that is stuff I will work on as I have more time. So now let me say hello to the people who are here and then I will start reading and I will start explaining what I am doing tonight and um, where we are in Otherland, the first book, City of Golden Shadow. So Ray is the first on the list here. And hello, Ray, greetings to you. Jeremy, hello, it's not too cold in my basement lair. No, it's just I was given another one of these woolly sheep shirts. Deb keeps giving them to me. I, she, she probably likes the way they feel. They feel like poodle skirts used to feel, if any of you know anybody who has a poodle skirt or have one yourselves. It has that kind of fluffy feeling. Um, so Deb keeps giving them to me. I've got three of them now. And uh, they are rather nice for this time of the night downstairs. Ilva, hello, my dear. Good to see you. And good morning. Wouter, red bikini accident. <laughs> A bikini accident? No, I have not had any bikini accidents lately. Chris, good morning to you. Suzanne, good morning, Yorkshire. The sun has risen. Ooh, good. Glad to hear it. I was worrying about that today. I was going, hmm, hope the sun comes up in Yorkshire. Holger. Um, where we left off last time, we have, where we left, well, somebody's probably told you that, but, but basically where we are is we are still in Mr. J's, although we're going to very soon now, I think another four or five, three or four pages, we will be done with Mr. J's. Um, so what chapter is that? I can actually tell you, I think, um, chapter 11. So, um, and who else have we got? Um, oh, is Ilva not feeling well? I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, anyway, so Chris, hello, good to see you. Anamika, hello, hello. Um, that's okay, enjoy and see you next week. Well, okay, you don't want to read ahead. That, that's fine, I understand that, that's okay. Dirk, hello, thank you. As I said, it's not technically a sweater, it's, my wife calls it a poodle shirt. Um, so Felicity, hello. How are things in Kiwi land? Good to see you. And who else have we got here that I haven't said hello to yet? Patrick. Good morning. Good to see you. Rosalba. Good morning to you too. Teddy like sweater. I have to tell you this quickly. I had a, I used to work back when I, before I got, when I was working on my first novel, Tell Chaser Song, many, 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 many years ago. I was working about three or four different jobs all at the same time, you know, kind of scattered around different times of the day and night, including among other things, I was an answering machine, uh, sorry, an answering service operator working the graveyard shift. But one of the other things I was doing was working in a French restaurant. The interesting thing about this French restaurant is it was run by two guys from Thailand. And uh, the, the chef, Johnny, had actually studied in France and all that and was a very good French chef. 
but he was Thai and he didn't speak English super well and neither did his business partner, Eddie. Um, but Johnny had a, you know, a great sense of humor, really nice guy. And he was positive that my name was not Tad, but Ted. He was just positive. So every time I would walk into the kitchen or whatever, he would immediately start singing the old Elvis Presley song, Baby Let Me Be Your Teddy Bear, except he would sing it with this very thick, I, I don't know what you'd call it, it wasn't even really an accent because his English was barely English. So, but it was really hilarious. I mean, he was always like, oh baby, let me be your little teddy bear. And um, it will be stuck in my head for life. And anyway, so that's what Chris's comment about me wearing my teddy-like sweater reminded me of. And Jeremy's my teddy bear sweater. Yes, so I, teddy bear, that's what Johnny used to call me. Um, anyway, <laughs> Suzanne. Okay, I agree with you. Yes, you'd have to learn it. We'd probably have to learn all this stuff again if we reincarnate, especially if we reincarnate as like bugs or something, you know, and that would take quite a while. So, um, Hazel, hello. There's my mother-in-law. Good morning, sweetie. Good to see you. Hope you're well. Um, love to everybody on that end. And no, I will not call it Tad Talks. Ilva, I will not. No, that's that's too much of a dad joke, even for me. Kristen, yes, called Sherpa, could be. Could very well be called Sherpa. I have no idea. Um, all I know is that it's it's furry. It's furry like a poodle. And my wife is very fond of them. And I'm fond of them, too, so I keep getting them. So, yes, enjoy this one. You can see the detail on this one a bit better than you can on the, on the black one, certainly. Um, and uh, it has long sleeves. It's got kind of odd sleeves, actually, so it doesn't really feel like either a shirt or a sweater. See, it has these elasticy guys on it at the end. It's very odd. I don't quite know how I'm supposed to cope with that. Yeah, as you can see, I'm easily confused. Anyway, so time to read. We are, as I mentioned earlier, reading from Chapter 11, and it's called, what, Inside the Beast? Inside the Beast. Rini and Kabu have been in Mr. J's. They have been pursued by apparently evil minions of Mr. J's. They have found a bunch of very strange people who, who they now, at, at, at this part of the process, just now Rini has decided that they were actually children, perhaps even children like Stephen. Um, somehow trapped in the Mr. J's system. She doesn't know. But they took her to what they called the Colleen, which appears to be some kind of something um, that uses the VR uh, environment to hypnotize people. And Rini <coughs> has actually... Um, Kabu was basically caught up by this thing and she didn't know what to do and, and how to get them out. And the, this thing, this thing, which they, the kids called the Colleen, but it actually is more like Kali, the Hindu goddess of destruction. Um, Rini is being pull, kind of pulled in hypnotically by this thing. And then she decides the only thing that she can do to escape from this is to try to set the system that she is on from back at her college, the Polytechnic, to, to get it to f knock her offline is to literally have a health emergency. So she basically drives herself into um, having something like a heart attack. And that's where she is. So I'm going to read that last little bit. Um, she pictured her heart shuddering, hurrying. I'll die here, or fall down into madness forever. The dark muscle was a shy, secret thing like an oyster ripped from its shell, struggling hopelessly to survive, pumping hard, straining, losing the beat for a moment as the rhythms bounced awkwardly against each other. Streaks of hot and cold went jagging through her, fear to the toxic level, shivers of helpless animal panic, racing, fighting, failing. I'll be lost, just like Stephen, just like Kabu. Soon I'll be in the hospital, zipped into an oxygen-filled 
body bag, dead, dead meat. Images began to flash before her eyes, leaping out of the kaleidoscopic display that filled her vision. Stephen, gray and unconscious, lost to her, wandering somewhere in an empty, lonely place. I'm dying. Her mother, shrieking in agony during her final moments, caught on the upper floor of the department store as the flames climbed hungrily upward, knowing she would never see her children again. I'm dying, dying. Death, the destroyer, the great nothing, the freezing fist that seized you and squeezed you, crushed you into dust that floated in the blank dark between stars. Her heart stuttered, laboring toward failure like an overheated engine. I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm... The world jerked and turned gray. Light and dark were evenly smeared. Rini felt a sharp pain race down her arm, a streak of fire. She was in some between place. She was alive. No, she was dying. She... I'm out, she thought, and the idea rattled in her suddenly cavernous and echoing skull. The shrieking drone was gone. Her thoughts were her own, but even through the agony, a vast adhesive weariness pulled at her. I must be having a, a heart attack. But she had already determined her course before she had begun. She couldn't afford to think about what she was going to do, couldn't pay any attention to the pain, not yet. Backtrack. Last node. Her voice, though loud against the new stillness in her head, was only a dry whisper. Even before the gray had finished forming, it was gone. The cavern surrounded her again, the red light blazing. Her position had changed. Now she stood to one side of Kali, who was leaning forward over the hunched figure of Kabu like an interested vulture. The, the death goddess's arms were motionless, the maddening voice silent. Her veiled face pivoted toward the spot where Rini had reappeared. Rini leaped forward and seized the bushman's sim. Another jagged bolt of pain shot up her arm. She gritted her teeth and fought off a wave of nausea. Exit! she shouted, triggering escape for both of them, but aborted immediately when Kabu's part of the program didn't respond. Her stomach lurched again. The little man was still trapped, somehow, still hooked. She would have to find another way to get him out. A shadow swung across her like a negative searchlight. She looked up to see the scarlet-limbed figure of Kali looming above, arms spread wide. Oh, shit! Rini tightened her grip on Kabu, wondering how lifelike the simulation was. Bracing herself against the inevitable pain, she straightened suddenly and put a shoulder into the oracle's midsection. There was no sensation of contact, but the creature slid back several feet into the middle of the steaming pit. The monster hung in midair, bathed in the red glow, feet flattened on nothing. One of Kali's hands darted toward her own face and tore away the veil, revealing blue skin, a ragged hole of a mouth, a dangling red tongue, and no eyes. It was meant to hold Rini until the visual tricks could start again. It might have worked before, but now she had no strength left to be startled. I'm so tired of your goddamn game, she grunted. Black spots swam before her eyes, but she doubted they had anything to do with the programming in Mr. J's jolly little hellhole. Dizzied, she turned her face away from the blind thing and heard the ululation beginning again. Rini was having trouble breathing. Her voice was faint. Get stuffed, bitch! Random! The shift was surprisingly fast. The cavern dissolved, and for a moment a long, dark hallway began to form before her eyes. She had a dim perception of a near endless row of candelabra along the walls, each held by a disembodied hand. Then she was suddenly shifted again, 
this time without her command and against her will. This transition was not as smooth as the others. For several long instants, her vision was nauseatingly distorted, as if the new location would not come into correct focus. She tumbled and felt soft earth, or the simulation of it, beneath her aching body. She kept her eyes closed and reached out until her fingers touched Kabu's silent, still form. It was hard to imagine moving another inch, but she knew she had to get up and start looking for ways to get them out. We have only moments, someone said. Despite its urgent tone, it was a soothing voice pitched almost equally distant from the stereotypical extremes of both masculine and feminine. They will find it much easier to track you this time. Startled, Rini opened her eyes. She was surrounded by a crowd of people as though she were an accident victim lying in a busy street. After a moment, she saw that the forms around her were gray and still, all except one. The stranger was white. Not white as she was black, not Caucasian, but truly white with the blank purity of unsmirched paper. The stranger's sim, for that was what it must be, since she was clearly still inside the system, was a pure colorless emptiness, as though someone had taken a pair of scissors and snipped a vaguely human-shaped hole in the fabric of VR. It pulsed and danced along its edges, never entirely at rest. Leave us alone! It was difficult just to speak. She was short of air and a bright fist of pain was squeezing inside her ribcage. I cannot, although I am a fool to take this chance. Sit up and help me with your friend. Don't touch him! Stop being foolish. Your pursuers will locate you any moment. Rini forced herself up onto her knees and swayed for a moment, catching her breath. Who? Who are you? Where are we? The blankness crouched beside Kabu's unmoving form. The stranger had no face and no distinct shape. Rini could not tell what it was looking at. I am taking enough risks already. I cannot tell you anything. You may still be caught, and it would mean death to others. Now, help me lift him. I have little physical strength, and I dare not bring more power to bear. Rini crawled toward the shapeless pair and for the first time took notice of her surroundings. They were in a kind of open grassy park pinned beneath dark gray skies bounded by tall trees and ivy-choked stone walls. The silent figures that surrounded them stretched away on all sides, row after row, making the place seem a bizarre cross between a cemetery and a sculpture garden. Each shape was that of a person, some highly individual, some as featureless as the sims she and Kabu wore. Each had been frozen in some moment of fear or surprise. Some had stood a long time and, like the deserted structures of Toy Town, had lost their colors and textures, but most looked new minted. The stranger lifted its head as she approached. When something happens to one of the guests, while they are online, their sim remains. Those who own this place are amused to keep their trophies this way. Rini put her arms around under Kabu and lifted him into a sitting position. The effort made the edges of her sight go black for a moment. She swayed, struggling to maintain consciousness. I, I may be having a heart attack, she whispered. All the more reason to hurry, said the empty space. Now hold him still. He is a long distance away, and if he doesn't return, you will not be able to take him offline. I must send for him. Send for him? Rini could barely form the words. She was beginning to feel quite drowsy, and although a part of her was frightened by that, it was a small and diminishing part. <clears throat> this human-shaped blankness, the strange garden, there were simply a few more complications to an already complex situation. 
difficult to think about. It would be easier simply to let herself roll down into sleep. The honey guide will fetch him back. The stranger held up the blunt white shapes that were his hands, its hands, as if about to pray, but kept them a few inches apart. When nothing happened, Rini began gathering the energy to ask another question, but the featureless shape had become as rigidly still as any of the trophy garden's other residents. Rini felt a cold pall of loneliness settle over her. Everything was lost now. Everyone was gone. Why keep fighting when she could let go, could sleep? There was a stirring between the stranger's hands, then a sort of opening appeared there, a deeper nullity, as though something had cast a shadow onto naked air. The darkness flicked, then flicked again, then another white shape fluttered out of it. This smaller blank patch, which was bird-shaped in the way the stranger was human-shaped, fluttered onto the shoulder of Kabu's Sim, then crouched there for a moment, vibrating gently, like a newborn butterfly drying its wings. Rini stared in lazy fascination as the tiny white shape slid close to Kabu's ear, or the rudimentary fold in his simulation that represented it, as if to share a secret. She heard a high-pitched trill, then the bird thing leaped into the air and vanished. The larger blankness abruptly shivered back into life. It leaped up and smacked its rudimentary hands together. Go now! Hurry! But... Rini looked down. Kabu was moving. One of his sim hands clenched fitfully as though trying to catch something that had flown away. You can take him back now, and you must take this, too. The stranger plunged one arm inside itself, then pulled out something that glimmered with a soft amber light. Rini stared. The stranger reached and took her hand with its other arm, peeled open her clenched fingers, and dropped the object onto her palm. She wondered for a moment at the mundane and unremarkable touch of the ghostly presence, then looked down at what had been given to her. It was a round yellow gem, cut into hundreds of facets. What? What is it? It was becoming hard to remember much of anything. Who was this gleaming white shape? What was she supposed to be doing? No more questions, it said sharply. Go! Rini stared for a moment into the void where its face should be. Something swam through her mind, down, deep, and she struggled to identify it. Go now! She squeezed Kabu a little tighter. He felt as slender as a child. Yes, of course. Exit! The garden popped like a soap bubble. Everything was very dark. For a moment, Rini thought they had become stuck in transition until she remembered the headset. She lifted her arm, gasping at the painful effort, but managed to tip up her visor. The view around her improved only a little. She still saw mainly gray, although now there were dark stripes as well. Then she understood that the blurry verticals were the straps of the harness room. She was hanging in place, swinging slightly. She turned. Kabu was dangling beside her, but it was the real Kabu in his real body. As she watched, he shivered convulsively and lifted his head, eyes rolling as he tried to focus. Kabu! Her voice sounded muffled. She was still wearing her hair plugs, but she couldn't work up the strength to lift her arm again. There was something she needed to tell him, something important. Rini stared at him, trying to remember, but her head was beginning to feel very heavy. Just before she gave up, it came to her. Call an ambulance, she said, and laughed a little at the oddness of it. I, I think I'm dying. Chapter 12. Looking Through the Glass. Netfeed News. California's Multi-Marriages Now Law. Visual 
two women, one man, all wearing tuxedos, entering Glide Memorial Church. Voice over. Protesters howled outside as the first of California's newly legalized multi-partner marriages took place at a church in San Francisco. The man and two women said it was a great day for people who don't have traditional two-person relationships. Visual, Reverend Pilker at Church Rostrum. Not everyone agrees. The Reverend Daniel Pilker, leader of the fundamentalist group Kingdom Now, called the new law indisputable evidence that California is hell's back door. Paul stepped through and out. The golden light faded and he was in emptiness again. The mist stretched away in every direction, as heavy and empty as before, but there was nothing else. There was no finch or mullet either, which was a great relief. But Paul had been hoping that he would find something more on the other side of the glowing gateway. He wasn't quite sure what home meant, but in the back of his mind, he had been hoping to find exactly that. He sank to his knees, then lowered himself until he lay stretched on the hard and featureless earth. The mists swirled around him. He closed his eyes, exhausted, without hope or ideas, and for a while gave himself to the dark. The next thing he was aware of was a quiet whispering, a thin, papery sound that grew out of the silence. A warm breeze stroked his hair. Paul opened his eyes, then sat up, full of wonder. A forest had sprung into being around him. For a long time he was content just to sit and stare. It had been so long since he had seen anything but blasted fields of mud that the sight of unbroken trees, of thickly tangled branches still bearing their leaves, soothed his spirit, like a drink of water to a thirsty man. What did it matter that most of the leaves were yellow or brown, that many had already fallen to earth and lay ankle-deep around him? Just the return of color seemed a gift beyond any price. He stood. His legs were so stiff that they might have been things discarded by someone else that necessity compelled him to use. He took a great breath of air and smelled everything. Damp earth, the scent of drying grass, even the faintest tang of smoke. The sense of the living world coursed through him so powerfully and so richly that it awakened hunger inside him. He suddenly wondered when he had last eaten. Bully beef and biscuit. Those were familiar words, but he could not remember what the things they named were. In any case, it had been long ago and far away. The warm air still surrounded him, but he felt a moment of inner chill. Where had he been? He had a memory of a dark, terrifying place, but what had he been doing there? Or how he had left had slipped from his mind. The very lack of things to remember meant that their absence did not worry him long. Sun was filtering down through the leaves, making spots that swam like golden fish as the wind moved through the trees. Wherever he had been, he was in a living place now, a place with light and clean air, a carpet of dry leaves, and even, he tilted his head, the distant sound of a bird. If he could not remember his last meal, well... That was all the more reason to find himself another. He would walk. He looked down. His feet were shod in heavy leather shoes, which at least felt familiar and correct, but nothing else in his attire seemed quite right. He wore heavy wool stockings and pants that ended not far below his knee, as well as a thick shirt and waistcoat, also of wool. The fabric seemed strangely rough beneath his fingers. The forest stretched away in all directions, revealing nothing that looked like a road or even a trail. He pondered for a moment, trying to remember which direction he had been traveling when he stopped. But that, too, was gone, evaporated as completely as the bleak mist, which was now the only thing that he remembered with certainty had existed before the forest. Granted an open choice, he noted the stretching shadows and turned to put the sun at his back. At least he would be sure of seeing his way clearly. 
He had been hearing the intermittent bird song for a long time before he finally saw its author. He was kneeling, freeing his stocking from a bramble bush, when something brilliant glided through a column of sunshine just ahead of him. A flash of green, both darker and shinier than the moss crawling on the tree trunks and stones. He straightened, looking for it, but it had vanished into the shadows between trees. All that remained was a trill of piping music, just loud enough to claim a single echo for its own. With a stiff tug, he pulled himself out of the bramble bush and hastened in the direction the bird had gone. Since he had no path, he thought he might as well follow something pretty as plod on with no better destination in mind. He had been walking for what seemed hours and had seen no sign of change in the endless forest. The bird never came close enough for him to see it completely clearly, but neither did it disappear from sight. It flitted from tree to tree, always just a few dozen paces ahead. On the few occasions where the branch it chose for a resting place was in sunlight, he could see its emerald feathers shining, an almost impossible glow as though it blazed with some inner light. There were hints, there were hints of other colors too, a dusky purple like an evening sky, a hint of darker color along the crest. Its song also seemed somehow less than ordinary, although he could remember no other bird's song for comparison. In fact, he could remember very little about any other birds, but he knew that this was one, that its song was both soothing and alluring, and that was enough to know. Afternoon wore on, and the sun passed out from behind the gaps in the treetops, sliding toward the hidden horizon. He had long ago stopped worrying about what direction it shone, so caught up had he become in his pursuit of the green bird. It was only when the forest began to darken that he realized he was lost in a trackless wood, with night coming on. He stopped, and the bird alighted on a branch not three steps from it, not three steps from him. It cocked its head. There was a dark crest, and gave voice to a melodic trill that, though swift and bright, had something in it of a question, and something in it even less definable, but which made him suddenly mournful for his lost memory, for his directionlessness, for his solitude. Then, with a flip of its tail that revealed the midnight purple brushing underneath, the bird spread its wings and spiraled up into the air to disappear among the twilight shadows. A last thread of song floated down to him, sweetly sad, diminishing to nothing. He sat down on a log and put his head on his hands, in his hands, overcome with the weight of something he could not define. He was still sitting that way when a voice made him jump. Here, none of that. These are good solid oaks, not weeping willows. The stranger was not dressed much differently than he, all in rough browns and greens, but he wore a broad strip of white cloth tied around one arm like a bandage or a token. His eyes were a strangely feline shade of tawny yellow. He held a bow in one hand and a skin bag in the other. A quiver of arrows stood up behind his shoulder. Since the newcomer had made no hostile moves, he felt it safe to ask him who he was. The stranger laughed at the question. The wrong thing to be asking here. Who are you, then, if you're so clever? He opened his mouth, but found he could not remember. I... I don't know. Of course not. That's the way of this place. I came in after... Oh, I'm not certain, you know. I think it was a deer. And now I won't remember my name again until I'm on my way back out. Queer, this forest. He extended the skin bag. Are you thirsty? The liquid was sour, but refreshing. When he handed it back to the stranger, he felt better. The conversation might be confusing, but at least it was a conversation. Where are you going? Do you know that? I'm lost. Not surprised. As to where I'm going, it's out. Not a good place to be after dark, these woods. But I seem to remember something just outside the forest that feels like a good destination. Perhaps it will be the kind of place you're looking for. The stranger beckoned. In any case, come along. We'll see if we can't do you some good. 
He quickly rose to his feet, afraid that the invitation might be rescinded if he took too long. The stranger was already pushing through a tangle of young trees, which had made a hedge around the wreckage of their toppled older relative. They traveled for a while in silence as late afternoon twilight gradually deepened into evening. Fortunately, the stranger held down his pace. He seemed like the sort who could have traveled much faster if he chose, and remained even in the dying light, a dark shape only a few steps ahead. At first he thought it was the night air, that the colder sharpness was bringing a different kind of sound to his ear, a different kind of scent to his nostrils. Then he realized that instead it was a different kind of thought that was suddenly drifting through his mind. I was somewhere else. The sound of his own voice was strange after the long time without speaking. A war, I think. I ran away. His companion grunted. A war. Yes, it's coming back to me. Some of it, anyway. We're getting near the edge of the forest, that's the reason. So you ran away, did you? But, but not for the normal reasons. At least I don't think so. He fell silent. Something very important was swimming up from the depths of his mind, and he was suddenly frightened he might grab at it too clumsily and, and lose it to the darkness once more. I was in a war and I ran away. I came through a, a door or something else, a mirror, an empty place. Mirrors. The other was moving a little more quickly now. Dangerous things. And, and he curled his fists as though memory could be tightened like a muscle. And my name is Paul. He laughed in relief. Paul. The stranger looked back over his shoulder. Funny sort of name. What does it mean? Mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's what I'm called. It's an odd place you come from, then. The stranger fell silent for a moment, though his legs still carried him forward in long steps that had Paul hurrying to keep up. I'm Woodling, he said at last. Sometimes Jack of the Woods or Jack Woodling. That's my name, because I do tramp all the woods near and far. Even this one, though I don't like it much. It's a fearful thing for a man to lose his name, although perhaps not so much when a name doesn't mean aught. It's still a fearful thing. Paul was struggling with the new ideas that were suddenly skittering through his head like beetles. And where am I? What place is this? The nameless wood, of course. What else would it be called? But where is it? In what country? Jack Woodling laughed. In the, the king's land, I suppose. The old king's land, that is, although I trust you've got the sense not to call it that among strangers. You may tell her ladyship I said so, though, if you meet her. His smile brazed. <coughs> Excuse me. You may tell her ladyship I said so, though, if you meet her. His smile bra blazed briefly in the shadows. You must be from somewhere far away indeed that you concern yourself with such schoolmasterish things as the names of places. He paused and pointed. There it is, then, as I hoped it will be. They had stopped on a high place at the edge of a narrow valley. The trees fell away down the gradually sloping hillside. For the first time, Paul could see some distance in front of him. At the bottom of the valley, nestled between the hills, a cluster of lights gleamed. What is it? An inn, and a good place. Jack Woodling clapped him on the shoulder. You will have no trouble finding your way from here. But aren't, aren't you going? Not me? Not tonight. I've things to do and elsewhere to sleep. But you will find what you need there, I think. Paul stared at the man's face, trying to make out the expression through the night shadows. Did he mean more than he said? If we are going to split up, then I want to thank you. You probably saved my life. 
Jack Woodling laughed again. Don't put such a burden on me, good sir. Where I go, I must travel light. Fare you well. He turned and moved back up the hillside. Within moments, Paul could hear nothing but the leaves rustling in the wind. The sign swaying in the wind over the front door named the inn the King's Dream. It was crude, as though it had been put up hurriedly to replace some earlier insignia. The small figure painted below the name had his chin on his chest and his crown tipped low over his eyes. Paul stood for a moment just outside the circle of lantern glow puddled in front of the door, feeling the great trackless weight of the forest breathing like a dark beast at his back, then stepped forward into the light. Perhaps a dozen people were ranged about the low-ceilinged room. Three of them were soldiers, in surcoats as bloody red as the joint that turned on a spit over the fireplace. The young boy tending the spit, so covered with soot that the whites of his eyes were startling, gave Paul a furtive look when he came in, then quickly turned away with an expression that might have been relief. The soldiers looked at Paul, too, and one of them inched a little way down the bench they shared, toward the place where their pikes leaned against the whitewashed clay wall. The rest of the denizens, dressed in rough peasant clothes, paid him the attention any stranger would receive, staring as he made his way to the landlord's counter. The woman who waited for him there was old, and her white hair, disarranged by heat and sweat, looked something like the fleece of a sheep kept out on a bad night. But the forearms, bared by rolled sleeves, looked strong, and her hands were pink, calloused, and capable. She leaned on the counter in obvious weariness, but her gaze was shrewd. We've no beds left. She wore an odd smirk on her face, which Paul could not immediately understand. These fine soldiers have just taken the last of them. One of the red-smocked men belched. His companions laughed. I, I'd like a meal and something to drink. A dim memory of how these things worked wriggled into Paul's thoughts. He suddenly realized he had nothing in his pockets but air, and no purse or wallet. I have no money, I'm afraid. Perhaps I could do some work for you? The woman leaned forward, inspecting him closely. Where are you from? A long way away. The other side of the nameless forest. She seemed about to ask something else, but one of the soldiers shouted for more beer. Her lips thinned in annoyance, and, Paul thought, something more. Stay here, she told him, then went to deal with the soldiers. Paul looked around the room. The hearth urchin was staring at him again, with an intensity that seemed closer to calculation than curiosity. But Paul was tired and hungry, and did not much trust his own overstrained perceptions. "'Let's talk about the work you might do,' the woman said when she returned. "'Follow me back here, where it's less noisy.' She led him down a narrow stairway to a cellar room that was clearly her own. The walls were lined with shelves, and they and every other surface were crammed with spools and skeins, jars and boxes and baskets. Except for the small pallet bed in the corner and a three-legged stool, the room looked more like a shop than a bedroom. The landlady sank onto the stool, fluffing her rough woolen skirt, and kicked off her shoes. "'I'm that tired,' she said. "'I couldn't stay on my feet a moment longer. I hope you don't mind standing. I've only the one stool.' Paul shook his head. His attention had been captured by a small, thick-paned window. Through the distorted glass, he could see water moving and glinting in the moonlight outside. The inn evidently backed on a river. Now then, the old woman's voice was suddenly sharp. Who sent you here? You're not one of us. Paul turned around, startled. The landlady had a, had a knitting needle gripped in her fist, and while she showed no immediate sign of getting up from the stool and coming after him with it, neither did she look particularly friendly. Woodling, his name was. Jack Woodling. I, I met him in the forest. Tell me what he looks like. 
Paul did his best to describe what had been, after all, a rather nondescript man seen largely in twilight and later in darkness. It was only when he remembered the white cloth tied around his Savior's arm that the woman relaxed. You've seen him, sure enough. Had he any message for me? He could not think of anything at first. Do you know who her ladyship would be? The woman smiled sadly. No one but me. He said something about it being the old king's woods, though. I shouldn't say that to anyone except her ladyship. She chuckled and tossed the knitting needle into a basket with several dozen others. That's my Jack, my paladin. And why did he send you to me? Where is this place you're from beyond the nameless woods? Paul stared at her. There was something more than ordinary weariness in her features. Her face seemed almost like something that had been soft once but had been frozen into harsh creases by some terrible winter. I don't know. I... There's something wrong with me. I was in a war, that's all I remember. I ran away. She nodded her head as if to the sound of an old familiar tune. Jack would have seen that, all right. No wonder he took a shine to you, she sighed. <sighs> but I told you rightly enough earlier, I have no bed. The blasted robin red breasts have taken the last of them, and with not so much as a copper to pay me for my trouble. Paul frowned. They can do that. Her laugh was rueful. They can do that and more. This is not my land anymore, but hers. Even here in my pitiful burrow, she sends her strutting fellows to mock me. She will not harm me. What use having one without the only person who can appreciate it? But she will make me as miserable as she can. Who is she? I don't understand anything you're saying. The old woman stood up, puffing out breath as she did so. You're better off if you don't. And you're also better off not staying in this country long. It isn't very friendly to travelers anymore. She picked her way through the sea of bric-a-brac, leading him back to the door. <coughs> I'd put you up here on my own floor, but that would only make those roundheads upstairs wonder why I'd take an interest in a stranger. You can sleep in the stable. I'll say you're going to do some hauling for me tomorrow so you won't attract attention. I can at least give you food and drink, for Jack's sake. But you're not to mention to anyone that you met him, and certainly not what he said. Thank you. You're very kind, she snorted, making her slow way up the stairs. Falling to a low estate can do that. You see so much more of the world than you did before. You become very aware of how thin the line is, of how little safety exists. She led him back up to the noisy common room, where they were greeted by rude questions from the soldiers and the watchful eyes of the hearth boy. I think we're going to stop there, since it's just about time, and it starts a new little section where the next part of Paul's adventure continues. But that will happen tomorrow night. Now I have to wait for my camera to find me. So I'll be beautifully in focus for my final goodbye where I say, bleep, 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 that's all, folks. Um, but since it's not in any hurry to focus in on me, I won't worry about it. So with that... Thank you so much for joining me. I will be back at 7 p.m. today, tonight, however you want to look at it. Um, and we will continue with Paul's adventures in, well, if you don't know already, you'll figure it out pretty quick. And meanwhile, I say to all of you, besides my gratitude at you for joining me for these little excursions, to take good care of yourselves, take good care of those around you, your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, uh, anybody who might need some help, as I said last week, uh, this is a very good time during the winter, um, if you haven't done it already, to donate some clothing or something to a homeless shelter. 
Uh, it's probably cold out there where you are. It's even cold here in California. Not a good time to be without a home in the middle of a pandemic. So if you can do anything like that, it's a good time to do it. Um, and then I will either see you 7 p.m. or obviously many of you are on European or other time, New Zealand time, other places. Um, and uh, so if not, I'll see you next week when I return at this same TAD time, same TAD channel. And we will all get together then down by the river, as it were. Anyway, thank you. Good night.